Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, brought to you by Penn Energy and sponsored by Allegro and Sapient Consulting. Today's event, Growth Imperatives for Commodities Firms, will be presented by Ujwa Ben, Vice President at Sapient Consulting, Michael Hinton, Chief Strategy and Customer Officer at Allegro, Roberta Bigiani, Vice President, IDC Energy Insights, IDC Government Insights, and IDC Health Insights. Beck Wilson, Application Development and Software Architecture for Sapient Global Markets. This presentation is live and interactive, so you can ask questions at any time by clicking in the Ask a Question box in the presentation window, and then clicking the Submit button. If you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view this webcast. In addition, it is recommended that you close down all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants mm -hmm. with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible from the home page at www.pinenergy.com. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Roberta Bigiani. Thank you, Joe, and thanks to all of you that are joining today the call or even to the one that will be listening to the recording. As Joe mentioned, today our focus for the webinar is uh, the growth imperative for commodity firms. And of course, in our debate, uh, we will look at commodities from a broad perspective, not just focusing on one kind of technology uh, or, or commodities like energy or, or, or whatever. Now, the agenda for today is quite simple. I'm going to set the stage by sharing some brief consideration, and then, uh, with no further ado, I will uh, have the pleasure to moderate the panel debate with the distinguished speakers that Joey just briefly introduced. So let's get started with uh, um, the agenda. Imperatives for change. I think that there is no presentation or article in this day that is not starting by talking about uh, the future transformation and sometimes digital transformation. Uh, personally, I'm always uh, um, quite uh, happy to say that, and to quote Heraclitus, uh, who say that nothing endures but change, and insist on the fact that the future is not tomorrow, it was already to yesterday, and it's, it's today. So transformation is happening and has happened and will continue to happen. What I think is a little bit peculiar of uh, our digital economy is that uh, the magnitude and the speed of change has uh, dramatically uh, accelerated, and this acceleration will never stop. It will just increase. So technologies like uh, uh, blockchain, uh, cloud, artificial intelligence, and many more others are really quickly dis disrupting and uh, transforming businesses in each and every industry, including the commodity business. Just think about uh, a recent initiative that uh, 23 European um, uh, energy companies uh, have started to launch a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, blockchain-based wholesale transaction market. Uh, again, this is just one of, out of the main examples uh, of the impact that new technologies might have on the acceleration of transformation of companies. And you can see some of the trends uh, I would like to briefly touch upon on the slide, but think about uh, the um, commodity firms that today have to really operate in a very highly competitive, dynamic, and complex environment. Uh, complexity being related about uh, to, to the fact that they have to do business uh, in increasing uh, dynamic, uh, uh, be, let's say, environment where regulation keep on changing, business models are evolving, and, uh, and also different trade flows. So think about global demand. The global demand for commodities has shifted to new geographies, and, uh, and this is true not just for energy technology, uh, commodities or, uh, or uh, metals, but for many others. And for instance, if you just think about energy, uh, China's primary energy consumption in the last 15 years tripled. In India, it doubled. And those two countries nowadays account for 28% 28, 28 of global primary energy consumption. And demand is also strongly affected by changes in um, the primary resources mix. Mature economies, for instance, are moving towards a more profound electrification, for instance, in um, transportation. 
um, climate change concerns are pressing for economic decarbonization and uh, the proliferation of renewables is phenomenal. And, and uh, actually, with the U.S. leaving the Paris Agreement, we can expect that China, will, uh, which was and is the most polluting country in the world, uh, will look to take the leadership in becoming the, uh, the leader of the, of the climate change uh, with the push in renewables, for instance. And that's, again, changing the uh, rule of the game. And uh, price volatility has increased, which is not by definition a, a bad thing for good traders. Actually, it's the, the opposite. But many companies are suffering um, still uh, from uh, price and, uh, and marginality pressures. Uh, for instance, think about uh, energy, uh, energy companies, which have still uh, some lost margin from the oil downturn to recapture. And, uh, Financial regulations and, and compliance uh, requirements such as uh, EMIR, Dodd-Frank, Remit, MFID, so many um, are becoming a, a real top challenge for commodity trading houses. Uh, and of course, compliance goes beyond, beyond the financial regulation to translate into corporate governance and risk governance. And again, these are on this slide and, and with my introduction, I'm just giving a real example of um, the many elements that are moving commodity firms to a continuous transformation. Now, for years, um, commodity uh, companies have been focusing on uh, cost reduction and efficiencies. Some, of course, are still dealing with aging risk management infrastructure or, uh, or trading cost rationalization. Um, so efficiency was and will always be a focus. But today, the conversation in the boardroom has, has, really, has really shifted from simply discussion uh, around uh, crunching costs and, uh, and, and cutting costs into conversations that are looking to enable growth, more revenues, higher margin. Many um, company, uh, commodity uh, firms are looking to take advantage from the new technologies and uh, approaches to create smarter and more agile business. Businesses that are capable of quickly react to market change, um, capable of more easily deploy and market new products and services, or enabling uh, a more commercially optimized supply chain. And that portion of the story, so the focus on the growth, is really the, um, the focus of the webinar for today. But before uh, moving into the, um, into the debate, let me just share one additional short comment about uh, the set of capabilities that uh, we think are needed to foster growth and are needed by commodity firms and trading companies. Um, first of all, the basic. There is no doubt uh, that uh, the, the solution needs to support across the trading process uh, for trading, risk management, risk control, and logistics. So the trader will need to have tools for the front office. Uh, the mid office uh, uh, will need risk analysis, price forecasting, trading limits, and, uh, of course, uh, um, if it's energy power scheduling, pipeline nomination is needed for logistics, and balancing settlement, contract management, and invoicing for, for the back end. And of course, all the integration with the um, general ERP uh, system or external price feed and exchanges. And, and of course, uh, all these solutions need to be compliant to the very many and continuously evolving, uh, evolving regulation. They need to be used to, to, to be accessed and used by, um, by, by the user. But that, those, if you will, are, are the basic. When uh, we ask uh, um, energy trading company, especially uh, um, we have done this, this exercise with uh, um, commodity firms focused on, on energy, and we ask them, what is top in your mind in terms of what is needed for uh, the must-have from an, an ETN solution? Well, scalability comes out at the top. It's a, it has always the highest mark across the board, and, and even smaller trading operations realize that uh, they will be at competitive advantage if they are capable to use information that are available to them. And of course, the other component uh, you can see on the slide is uh, uh, the fact that uh, um, the solution needs to streamline all the operation and make them uh, smoothly and, and, and quick uh, to, to cope with the uh, need of re reducing cost. But 
last but not and not least, uh, um, they ask for security. Solution needs to be secure, especially if cloud entering into the delivery model discussion. And, and we will have the chance to uh, briefly debate uh, around those dimensions that I just uh, briefly mentioned. So with no further ado, uh, let me get started uh, with the debate. Uh, with the, and, uh, and, and let me just reintroduce, if you will, uh, the, um, the distinguished panelists that, uh, that are with me in the call today. So Ulfwald Deb, Beck Wilson, and Michael Hinton. Now, I guess that the first question will be um, actually for you, Michael. Um, what I really would like to, uh, to understand from you is your opinion on how organizations can embrace the imperative of growing revenues and, uh, and move from the discussion on cutting costs to, um, to the growth. Well, as you mentioned earlier, the, the, the boardroom discussions have shifted. Uh, most companies that are in energy and in commodity businesses are not lifestyle companies, meaning that they're not happy with static cash flows. So the investors and the owners of these companies expect growth wherever they're at in the life cycle of their organization, whether they're a startup, whether they're a more mature organization looking to be acquired, they're ultimately looking to grow, and what that growth means is really about profits. As you mentioned, the discussions historically have been around creating more efficiencies and reducing expenses, but you can only go so far. So once you've got that in place, you need to be able to do more with less. And so that means growing the revenue side of the equation. And growing that revenue really means being able to sell and, and do more volumes of what you do, and then also to be able to do that at a higher price or maximize the margin associated with it. I guess I have a second question for you, uh, very much related to what you just described, which is why now? I mean, why we are uh, discussing about uh, um, the, the, this attention to growth now? What, what is different from uh, the, the past, in your opinion? Well, I think kind of more recently, you mentioned it before, with the downturn, particularly in the energy markets and the energy prices, a lot of the companies had to kind of contract and cut and reduce the expense side as much as they could to basically survive. And now that we've seen the prices kind of stabilize and, and, and kind of return and strengthen a bit more, the companies have already adjusted as far as they can go on the expense side. So now they need to focus on that growth and focus on increasing the volume and selling more of what they sell and then selling it for more again, increasing the margins associated with that. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I guess that what I would really like now to, um, to hear from, uh, and I, I think I will start these, uh, this question uh, by asking Uswal, um, what kind of uh, uh, new business opportunities can we envision? And, and I think that uh, uh, maybe uh, the, if I can try to, to simplify, we could categorize. We, we could talk about four different categories: so um, trading or doing businesses around new assets, moving from physical to financial, uh, considering new geographies, and then uh, uh, increase operation scale. So, Ujwal, what are your thoughts about? Uh, the first option, so trading or doing businesses around new assets. And have you got any um, interesting uh, experience or, uh, or example to highlight to the audience? Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> I think uh, you mentioned the uh, decarbonization of electricity a, a little bit earlier. So obviously, with the with the sort of the accent on renewables right now, um, you've got a situation where a lot of our clients, uh, and you know, in particular, some of our uh, European utility clients are very very um, active in this area. So they're trying to get a whole different set of generation assets. I mean, they've uh, traditionally had the the more sort of coal fired and gas fired uh, power plants, right? Uh, but now they're sort of moving more into, you know, wind parks and solar farms and what have you, right? So obviously that means that now with your asset characteristics becoming so different, right, you, you, the way that you trade around those assets also changes. So, you know, in order to be 
And so in, in the past, they wanted to be better at managing power plants and figuring out what the characteristics of, you know, ramp up, ramp down time, uh, you know, peak uh, load and so on would be, right? Now they're in a position where they need to figure out uh, some different characteristics, which is, you know, uh, they need to get really good at predicting the weather, for example, right? Because that drives a lot of uh, different behavior and, and how you would actually, you know, invest your, your dollars uh, in terms of figuring out your assets, yeah? Um, and and I think the the what we find is uh, one of our uh, one of our key uh, European clients has actually um, essentially invested a huge amount in their weather derivatives and forecasting business, right? Because they believe that that's the only way they can actually um, you know get ahead in this market, right? Um, and the way that they're sort of doing that is changing their uh, their accent on trading more from the medium to long term power markets which used to be the focus if you had more um you know fossil fuel based plants um to now when they're getting much better at the short term power markets because that is where a lot of the action is given the fact that you know you can't really predict the the weather 100% so you don't know how much wind will blow or how much the sun will shine so you need to be able to kind of trade away or trade in in the short term and so they're investing heavily in that area to make sure that they are well prepared to address this challenge, right? Thank you. That's that's a, a quite uh, a quite important element in, uh, in, in again enabling the growth uh, in terms of, of new focus. Maybe um, uh, can you share with us something uh, similar, but focusing on another opportunity, which is actually um, the aspect of moving from physical to financial. I mean, I think uh, it's what has happened is that uh, you know it's in some sense the it's the move from physical to financial comes about because you know you're you're moving into an area where you have different physical assets, right? And so that means that the way that you kind of uh, value those assets and the modeling that you put around them, right, uh, has to change significantly. And <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, you know, the way that you modeled a uh, a power plant as as a real option, right, you didn't have to necessarily go into a huge amount of detail as to you know what that the value of that option would be and so on, right. But in the case of uh, a, a wind farm or a, or a or a solar park, right, you've got to kind of you know, get much better at the modeling and, and figure out, you know, what is the value of the embedded option, you know, how would you kind of actually uh, look at the past um, weather data to kind of come up with the, the future forecast and so on and so forth, right? So I think it's, when we say moving from physical to financial, the way I think about it is, you know, you're, you're having to look at different financial aspects than what you used to earlier. And, and so that's leading to a lot of people having to, um, you know, sort of knuckle down and, and update their financial models in, in a very different way and, and get much more focused on that, right? Uh, so I, I, I don't think it's uh, necessarily, a, um, a, you know, a wholesale move from physical to financial, but it's more like different kinds of physical assets lead to uh, a deeper sort of financial, uh, a need for a deeper financial understanding of those assets, yeah? I, I think also kind of adding to that that area is, you know, moving from physical to financials also allows customers to take advantage of maximizing revenue uh, and really optimizing that revenue stream by being able to improve their hedging strategies and then even being able to transact and trade more complex instruments around options that allow people to take advantage of upside as opposed to just truly doing hedging with linear instruments and allowing them to maximize that revenue as a result of that. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point. And uh, so we have seen uh, uh, new asset, uh, new aspect on physical and, and financial dimension. Uh, Michael, what do you think about uh, new geographies? Is, are new geographies representing an opportunity for growth for commodity firms? A absolutely, absolutely. As you know, the, the commodity markets are, are global in nature. There's definitely huge opportunities from that. Um, we actually have a customer that, that kind of cuts across several of these examples in that uh, they operate in the Japanese market and with kind of the changes in the market moving off of nuclear and moving towards 
natural gas basically created opportunities for them as a result of, of the increased demand of LNG into that area. So we've seen companies uh, create joint ventures to create larger demand positions to be able to allow them to contract more efficiently and then transact around new assets around such as uh, LNG uh, regasification and liquefaction facilities. But coupled with that, it allows them to reach into new geographies as well. So a lot of the Japanese firms have set up trading shops here in North America to get closer to the supply and be able to procure natural gas in North America and then move it through those facilities to really optimize their purchasing capabilities and, and, and improve their overall revenue streams as a result of that. And um, Ushwa, do you want to add anything on uh, this aspect of uh, the new geographies? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of, uh, as uh, Michael pointed out, I think there's definitely uh, this aspect of, uh, you know, changing the way that um, the supply chain uh, is, is configured. So one of our clients, for example, uh, which is a, a large energy um, uh, merchant in um, Europe, they've actually, uh, you know, created uh, satellite hubs uh, in in India uh, and and in the in Southeast Asia, which would essentially be you know um, there to source coal and other feedstocks, right? Uh, which you know initially they were a very very European based firm, but now they're kind of realizing that they need to go you know further afield in the search for uh, you know more um, I would say efficiencies and and uh, a better ability to kind of optimize the supply chain. Now, Beck, we kept you too quiet, so I would like to pose the next question to you, um, which is actually related to uh, still uh, the topic of uh, business opportunities for growth, uh, but the, focusing on a, on a fourth dimension, which is the increase of operation scale. So what do you think that uh, that opportunity means? Sure, I can talk about a couple of examples of that. As Mike and Ujwal are talking about, you know, new businesses and new locations, trading new assets, there's also the concept of once you put this new business online, what you typically do is you, you know, you, you want to you want to wade in before you jump in, right? So, you this may be a new business that you've been doing a little bit of, but you know you have to ramp it, and you have to scale it to get to the profitability you need to be, or it may be a business that you've been doing, but you realize you've got to scale that business. And, the, and you're going to lean on the CTRM system to help you help you scale that business. For instance, a firm we work with, this is you know happening as we speak. Uh, they've got a modern CTRM system. It kind of touches on, a, on several things. Some things Mike talked about too. They're in a new geo. They're in the Bach and Shell all play. Um, so it's a new business too. They're, they're they're new at the Shell business. So new geo, new business, new some new counterparties. Um, new counterparts too, because there's something real new to this business too. They're dealing with you know trucks and rails. They've never they've never done done that before. So they brought this business online, and in in their terms, they they were running about 500 to a thousand trucks a month. CTRM system was handling things fine, but they realized they needed to be running 5,000 to 10,000 trucks a month. And doing some math, they realized they were using a couple, a couple people in the back office full time. And to get to what they needed to get to, they, they were going to end up having you know, 10 or 12 people in the back office to, to support this business. And that wasn't going to work for them. So to scale the business, they really had to work with the CTRM vendor and the CTRM system and really scale automation. It's not so much about technology scale. It was putting more business processes in the system. Ramping them up, letting the you know using automation to do. Mike also mentioned something else earlier. More with less, and they had to do that because this business was not going to work for them when when they took it to where they needed to be. They're running right now about ten thousand trucks a month, and they had to add two people versus ten, and so it and they're you know they're proud of where they are. This the CT arm system was was huge in that process. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that, that's a, a, another very, very interesting element and, and point to, to make. 
So I think that um, if, uh, uh, Tammy, you don't mind, I would like to push the first poll uh, so that people in the call can uh, can take a few seconds and and um, look for uh, for the answer. So I think that people should see it online. And uh, um, the qu let me read the question. Uh, would you say that your business is currently in a period of growth? Uh, and with growth, uh, uh, mean, uh, uh, meaning what we were just debating with Uzwal, Michael, and Beck. So if uh, you don't mind to push the, the poll, and, and, and uh, give, we will give a few seconds to all of you to basically answer. And uh, uh, I, I think that the people can see the, the results. If you don't mind to push them to the audience, but uh, um, from what I see on my console, basically uh, the answer yes uh, is uh, is quite uh, is quite significant and is changing a little bit and now it's seventy seventy percent so seven zero. Um, so uh, maybe uh, Ulva, uh, I don't know if you want to comment uh, while people are still a little bit voting on uh, on. The blue or, or the green, well, the blue is the yes and, uh, and uh, the green being the no in terms of uh, there is still people that is not uh, on, the, on, the, on the path of growth. I mean, uh, it's clear. I think uh, Michael talked about it a little bit earlier as well. I think um, at least in, in the, the clients that we work with, we are definitely seeing that after a little bit of a, a lull in the past, uh, you know, couple of years, I think we're definitely seeing a period of growth, and I think that's reflected in these, um, in these survey results here, right? Because you know, yeah. almost three fourths of the people uh, think that their uh, business is currently either growing business lines or assets or in, uh, expanding into newer geographies, and I think that is sort of the nature of the game, right? So unless and there is a, a severe uh, downturn. I mean, most companies want to grow their business uh, in, in, you know, either in scope or in scale, right? So. Yeah. yeah, I guess, again, the answer was easy, yes or no, but I think that uh, is, is, uh, is, is really supporting what we have discussed in the first part of our, uh, of our debate and, 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 the sem and, and the seminar, the webinar. So maybe um, we can now move uh, a little bit uh, to another dimension with, uh, with our debate. And we have discussed about uh, the need to grow, the aspect of uh, and, and the business opportunity to grow. Uh, but now let's talk about uh, the pillar for uh, executing this growth, and uh, let's consider maybe um, four category: um, infrastructure, data, processes, and uh, a different way of uh, in interacting with the ecosystem. Um, so um, the, uh, the service model that can be uh, adopted. So maybe, uh, Beck, let's start with you and uh, let's uh, discuss about, uh, in terms of pillars for growth, uh, the opportunities that are offered by the infrastructures. Sure, thanks. Yeah, we, we, we look at infrastructure sort of a, there, there's two offerings inside of infrastructure. There's of course, the scale word again, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And there's also sort of the communication and integration components of infrastructure that are that are very big to allow this growth and this newness and this change to happen. You know, about scale, without dragging this down into the into the technology weeds, there's you know there's there's two there's two components there too. There's sort of the the infrastructure of the enterprise. What does the enterprise allow us to do? We have to look at a lot of things as we're figuring that figuring this out and when we certainly won't figure it out here, right? But we is the enterprise infrastructure is is it premise based? Because that that tells us a certain set of questions and a certain set of due diligence that, that we have to do to plan for growth. Or is it cloud based? Because that changes a lot of things. You know, is is if it's premise based, is it virtual? Is it physical? We won't we won't drag you into all those details, but we we really have to understand the infrastructure of the enterprise to make sure that this growth doesn't topple us or it doesn't. The idea on bringing on newness and bringing on new businesses, that's great. Bring it on and bring on a lot, right? But don't jeopardize the rest of the business. Don't jeopardize the the other users. Don't jeopardize the other customers. This thing has to be brought on seamless. So what can the enterprise infrastructure do for us? 
and you know that's just that just takes studying and, and expertise. And then, what can the CTRM system do for us? The enterprise may offer us an amazing environment, but the wrong CTRM system may not be able to take advantage of any of that. So, how much of this environment can the CTRM system draw upon to scale us, and how? Horizontally, can that CTRM system scale us? It, bringing on new business, you can't tear your CTRM system out and put a new one in. You can't be just stacking new servers. It, it's not a vertical play anymore. The vertical play is dangerous. It puts every every user in jeopardy. It's expensive. It takes a long time. None of this has anything to do with long periods of time, right? I mean, that these people decide what businesses they want to be in. It's kind of the fail fast con concept, right? Let's get in it. Let's test it out. Let's see if it works. If it, if it doesn't, let's get out. We don't have years to plan these events. So the CTRM system is, is important here. Can I bring on, can I add new processes? Can I add new P&L and position and analysis calculations to the, to the CTRM system easily? Can I scale them horizontally without just putting the system on Larger and larger iron. It's it's not a vertical play. And if I can if I can bring on new processes, can I feed those processes new gear? Right? Can I put more server, more CPUs under those processes? Will they take advantage of more and more processors varied onto those processes? I may have a process and it's doing great on one or two CPUs, and I I give it ten more CPUs, but it doesn't use them. So it's still about how do we horizontally lay the CTRM system across the infrastructure? Again, it's just don't put the rest of the business in jeopardy. So, yeah, two and, things and again. Upon, yeah. No, please. Sorry, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, just sort of in wrapping up, it's, it's, it's not just the CTRM system and it's not just the enterprise infrastructure. It's both of these components working together. Yeah, and, and, and again, uh, at the beginning I was pointing out like um, as, as many uh, companies, many commodity firms see the scalability issues like a sort of fundamental element and capability, it must have capability on the CTRM side, but you're right, there is also the enterprise side. But um, when we talk about infrastructure, I guess that there are also another dimension uh, um, in addition to the scale, which is a little bit the integration, if you will. And Michael, I don't know if you want to comment uh, on, uh, on this aspect a little bit. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the solutions no longer can live in isolation from one another. So the solutions need to, to seamlessly integrate and connect within the enterprise, whether that's connecting to SCADA information or production data or other things happening in the ERP solutions within the enterprise. And then beyond the enterprise, there needs to be connectivity uh, to market data, to counterparty information, to uh, exchange transactions, which you know ultimately allow these solutions to give proper visibility to the people who are running the operations on a daily basis. So integration is, is, is a key part of the infrastructure as well. Thank you. Uh, before I move to the to the next uh, pillar, um, let me just remind to the different uh, participants, uh, the people in the audience live, uh, to don't forget to post uh, your question at any time during the during the debate, so that we can um, take those questions and uh, and answer at the end of uh, of the of the panel. And so when we open to the live um, session with all the participants. Um, so uh, we discussed about the first pillar, so the pillar of infrastructure, and uh, I really would like now to move on uh, the next one, uh, which is, uh, uh, in my opinion, a very, very important one as the other, but uh, uh, which is the, the data. Data as pillar to enable growth. And maybe usual, um, I, I will ask you to start with that, and then uh, Michael and, and Beck, if you want also to spend a couple of words to integrate what Ushual uh, will be saying, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> it seems like th these days, every time you have a conversation, you know, data is a word which always pops up, and, you know, uh, more than likely people talk about big data as well. Uh, but in, in general, I think what we are seeing is that um, there is, you know, especially for the trading community, there's not only are there 
there's, there's more data available, right? But there's also different kinds of data available, right? Uh, and what, what I mean by that, just maybe I can clarify that with an example. Um, so, you know, one of our uh, clients uh, in, in, in Germany, uh, they are a utility with about, you know, 20 million odd customers. Uh, and, you know, traditionally the way that, um, you know, retail customers have been modeled uh, in the CTRM, ETRM world is that, you know, you take a set of profiles, uh, which are standard, and then say, okay, some of my customers fit profile A, some fit profile B, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so you get an approximation of what the demand forecast will look like, right, for a particular, uh, you know, week, day, month, year, whatever, right? Uh, I think now they're realizing that they've got to a situation where you've got, you know, smart meters at, at customer premises, which will allow you to actually get a much better view and a much more real-time view on what consumption is at, at any particular point in time. So if, if you can figure out a way to manage that data well, you can actually get a, a much deeper insight into, into your customer consumption and therefore your customer forecast at a much more uh, granular level. And that allows you essentially to, uh, you know, sort of update your forecasting and your, uh, your, your trading around the forecast uh, in order to kind of, you know, essentially uh, leverage the, uh, the the value of that increased granularity of data, right? So hopefully you can make better forecasts and that will help you to, sort of, you know, balance your um, uh, your trade portfolio much better, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of one example. I think another example of, um, you know, different kinds of data which people are using uh, is uh, what one of our uh, clients with a substantial shipping fleet, uh, they've actually figured out a way to um, to uh, sort of geolocate their their ships in a in a in a very real time fashion, right? Um, and <clears throat> what they're trying to do is to essentially create a market intelligence system which will allow them to look at their overall shipping portfolio and what they're shipping on these on these vessels. Uh, with the result that, let's say, if you are, you know, shipping something from, you know, Cartagena in Colombia to uh, Rotterdam in in uh, Netherlands, uh, then you can actually, you know, keep sort of valuing the position, right? And and say suddenly, let's say halfway down that journey, you find that it's probably more profitable to move the cargo to Japan, right? Then you can actually take that decision on a real time basis. Uh, and and maybe even algorithmically take that decision sometime in the future, maybe not right now. Uh, so that allows you to kind of use the data that you're getting from different sensors and different um, mechanisms to actually make some real-time trading decisions which can significantly bolster your bottom line, right? So, you know, data is everywhere uh, and people think about it in sort of different different ways, but even on the trading side, you're seeing all different kinds of data which you can then use to kind of get some new uh, ways to kind of slice the onion, if you will. Thank you, Joshua. Michael, any additional comment or uh, consideration? I mean, I, I completely uh, agree with Ujwal in that, you know, data drives decision making and the ability to manage the data in large volumes of data and be able to visualize it and make decisions off of it is key. And examples of that include, you know, even the uh, producing side of the the value chain and that being able to make better decisions around forecasting productions and how things may impact that, uh, being able to forecast and transact either in the uh, long-term or the short-term markets will help you optimize the revenues associated with them. So, so, so data and, and the ability to manage it and, and, and make decisions from it is key. Beck, I would like also to hear from you on, on this point. You can sure. get the data is something I'm particularly, let's say, angry to hear people brainstorming because uh, I ask the three of you to, to jump in. But please, uh, head on top of what uh, your other colleagues have said, please. Which one made great points. There's a, there's a lot of different data. There's a lot more data. I think he also said data is everywhere. I agree, and, and Mike agrees too. And you, you need that data to make decisions, absolutely. And the trick is, you, and you've got to look at your CTRM system or, or your, your trading platform very closely. A lot of platforms have a lot of data, 
that you can't get to it. It's locked up. It's locked up in proprietary tables with complicated object models on top of them and, and no APIs, right? No user access. If you want to get to it, you're basically remodeling the data, right? And fragile queries and things to get to it. So the key too is to, is to have the data and handle the data and be able to manage the data, but, out, but you got to, you got to surface the data. You got to make it transparent. You got to make it visible. Let me at it, right? And the better systems now are doing that. They're giving us lots of smart APIs and sophisticated interfaces to that data. I, you know, it's all the data in the world's not any good if I can't touch it. So it's 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 key to let the customers at it. Thank you. Maybe we can now move to the uh, third pillar, which is uh, the pillar of processes. And I guess that, Michael, I will start um, with you uh, to comment on uh, how, the, how the processes need to be, uh, let's say, um, changed and how we can expect to have more movement from manual to more uh, manual and, and, and maybe also rigid processes into more agile one. So if you want to take on, on the process opportunity, please. Go ahead. A absolutely. Um, with the digital transformation, kind of the key is automation of the various parts of the business processes. And those can include, you know, everything from the, the front end around uh, electronic confirmations and over-the-counter trading processes to automation of exchange-traded transactions flowing uh, directly into the CTRM, ETRM solution so that you have single points of entry and then you have immediate uh, results and position analysis to electronic reconciliations for certificates or around accounts receivable and accounts payable activities to automation of compliance so you're having automatic submission of transactions to trading repositories to automation of controls really making the process more fluid. But I think the key is is really around being able to be flexible with that. Uh, business changes and rules around business change quite quickly. And so solutions need to be able to accommodate that change while also automating that entire process to ultimately give you the best visibility and the best controls around your daily operations. <clears throat> Uso, do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I fully agree with what Michael said. Uh, the flexibility of the processes are, are key, right? Uh, and you know, I, I just want to sort of uh, contrast uh, something that uh, we saw recently, where um, working with a client who wanted to develop a, a trading operating model uh, for a for a new business that they were uh, getting into. Uh, and you know, in the past, you would have had a situation where you know you did a let's say three to four month exercise, you know, coming up with the process model, making sure all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed, and, and everything was laid out on paper. Uh, and then you know what would happen typically is you would sort of implement those processes, but then the process model would you know be put away into a drawer somewhere, and and nobody would ever hear or, or see it again, right? Uh, and then stuff would just evolve organically, right? I think what um, you know people are realizing is that you don't actually need to go that way. Yeah, so you can actually uh, even make your processes more agile by essentially sort of going ahead and, and doing the important stuff, right? Uh, and then evolving it over time, um, rather than saying you know I need to kind of spend six months developing something and then executing, right? So it's a much more you know, let's test it, test and learn kind of uh, kind of model, even for the process side. I mean, when people think about agile, they tend to think of it as technology, but in this case, I think what we're seeing is that uh, you know people are getting more agile not only on the technology side, but even on the on the process and the um, uh, you know the, the business side, if you will, right. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, will, I would like to hear even more discussion around uh, the, the process agilities, but I think that we have to take into consideration also the timing. And uh, so I think I would like to uh, move to the fourth uh, pillar of um, the enabler for, uh, for growth and looking a little bit uh, um, to support and service models. And maybe um, back, uh, um, maybe I can start with you asking, uh, in your opinion, how could uh, 
uh, consulting company, let's say more broadly services company, uh, support commodity firm in their transformation. And, uh, and uh, how what we have described him now could, could happen and how you could help them, uh, help them to make this happening. Sure. If you look at it sort of specifically, we have capabilities around many things in this space. You know, it, it might be CTRM vendor selections or and implementations. You know, we can help them with custom code around these systems if we have to augment the systems or do proprietary work around the edges of these systems. Of course, we've got specific and deep skills around data analytics. Our firm's very involved in things like managed services around these systems. Maybe there's parts of these CTRM systems that the, the firm doesn't want to run. Maybe it's the night cycle they run every night or their, their, their batch processes or, or other day cycle processes that they, want, they need somebody to run to take it off their plate where they can focus on making their money. We also have specific capabilities around the cloud practice now. We're very proud of our cloud practice and center of excellence. So more and more of these applications are, are headed towards the cloud. Some of them are migrating to the cloud and some of them are starting in the cloud day one. We can certainly help, help customers with those issues too. If you, if, but if you step back away from all of that, just one tiny bit, and we also have advisory roles that, that we serve. A lot of times when people are trying to onboard this new business or, or decide what it may be or how do I get into it, how do I experiment it with it, how do I sort of gauge the opportunity, we also sit in, in with customers in, in, in an advisory role and it's sort of where a maybe consider it like we're a catalyst to, to change and a catalyst to help, helping them decide where, where they're going to go on this journey. It's not always about technology. It's, it's you know, about business processes and, and the, the institution itself. I mean, there, some of it is technology, of course, but, you know, the, the deal, there's a lot of new technology and it's, it's not all good for everyone. So we certainly are glad to help there, too. And uh, Uzo, any quick comment before I ask the, the same question to Michael? Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, uh, one, one thing that a lot of clients uh, seem to be looking for these days is, is just, uh, you know, what we like to call a sort of a digital agenda or a digital roadmap, right? Where, you know, people are saying, okay, I, I know I need to do a lot of things around digital transformation, but, you know, I'm not sure what that would actually look like, right? So, you know, we tend to go in and do like a short, sharp, four to five week exercise where you come up with what the overall roadmap looks like. And that gives a lot of clarity to people, right, especially at the, uh, the senior level, saying, okay, I, I understand where we have to go. Now let's figure out what's the, the right way to actually go ahead and do this, right? So that tends to be a, a very popular kind of uh, model that, that people go for. So, Michael, the same question to you uh, in terms of uh, um, service models and support, but uh, maybe taking the angle of the solution uh, aspect and uh, as, as a solution provider. Yeah, and again, from the solution provider, I think probably what's most important and what we can do is to continue to leverage and exploit technology and, and even more importantly, new technologies through innovation. So the solution providers have a whole set of new technologies. They might include mobile apps to allow people to stay connected to what's going on in their businesses and be able to make decisions while away from the office to utilizing the cloud as a tool to help ease and, and reduce the costs of, say, deploying these solutions, but more importantly, give them the ability to scale and to do burst type computing when needed. And then also exploiting things like blockchain to have more secure transactions, uh, help eliminate uh, middlemen in the processes. But really the key is to continue to innovate and in, in, in leverage and exploit technology. Thank you very much. Um, like I, I really need to ask you this because uh, uh, during the call we mentioned cloud and uh, um, we I think I mentioned security in in, um, in one of my slides. Um, what about security concern uh, uh, when you are interacting with um, commodity firms and, and um, what is your suggestion to them uh, again, especially when cloud is concerned? 
Yeah, sure. Of course, that's the number one concern with the cloud, and everybody understands that. And that's not we we won't make light of about how serious security is with the cloud. But again, I think you, you have to you have to sort of step back and look at what what you're doing right now. For instance, a lot of firms that we talk to are very very worried about the cloud. But when we evaluate their their systems, their systems are, are in a data center today that has a lot of internet, a lot of internet connectivity to it already, and sometimes their systems are in a data center, and parts of their systems are in the open public internet. They may bring in, be bringing in, you know, customers or shippers in over the internet. Maybe some users are coming in over the internet. So, again, not to play down the security concerns of the cloud, but but it's you know you got don't fear the cloud if if you might already be in the public internet because it, it's not adding that much more. If you're already in the public internet now, if you're not in the public internet already, yes, the cloud adds some exposure, no doubt. But the thing to remember is there, you know, there's a lot of systems out in the cloud already, and there's so much energy, there's so much talent, there's so many people securing these systems that the clouds have giant. The cloud vendors have big security teams. Of course, your business has a has a smart security team. Guys like Sapient, our, our firm understands cloud security and how to secure these applications. Of course, Allegro is getting more and more experience with their systems out in the cloud, so they can help too. So the reality is it is important, and we're not downplaying it, but there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of talent, and inside these clouds today, there is so much opportunity with software services and hardware gear and appliances we can make these systems secure. It's, you don't just flip a switch, but it's doable. There's a lot of talent. There's a lot of expertise around it right now. <clears throat> yeah, and sometimes we underestimate uh, the uncapabilities or, or the risk uh, that we put in terms of security, even in in, uh, in the fence, let's say, in the castle, which is not the way to protect from um, looking ahead. But uh, but anyway. Um, I really would like to, to thank you. Uh, I have a, a very final uh, question for all of you, but maybe we could uh, push the poll so with the second uh, with the second question for the audience, so that we also uh, bring them on board. So, if you don't mind to push uh, uh, the poll, let me also read the the, um, the question: Is your business currently taking act, any action for uh, for future growth? And the answer is always very very simple: yes or no. So, please post your questions. We will leave you a few seconds. Um, to, to choose the yes or no. And uh, while you're doing it, uh, let me also remind uh, uh, that uh, um, you can post the question because we are going to open for a, for a Q&A. Uh, we, maybe we'll not have so much time, but please post your question because um, if uh, we are not going to answer immediately, we will definitely follow up uh, uh, offline uh, to, to provide you the feedback. So... If I look at the results, uh, uh, the, the vast majority, once again, I mean, we are always in this uh, uh, 75, 25 uh, kind of distribution compared to the previous question where a, a lot of people is saying, yes, we are taking action for, uh, for future growth. So um, maybe um, considering these people that is taking action and the one that are still a little bit uh, in a sort of pause moment, um, we can we can close our panel debate uh, with uh, really a sort of uh, final, very very quick uh, advice from the three of you uh, to all our attendees in terms of uh, what would be your one your priority one call to action for uh, for the attendees, your uh, one word recommendation. And I don't know if Michael, you want to start. Sure. Um I would say probably the, the key point is to help facilitate the growth within your organizations. I would say, you know, leverage your CTRM, your ETRM, and the breadth of its capabilities and the ability for it to scale and meet the needs of, of your growth, whether that be moving into new geographies, moving into new commodities, um, or the, 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 the need to handle different granularities of business as the business begins to evolve. But I would say the biggest thing is, is leverage its capabilities to 
uh, help streamline your business and then give you better visibility so that you're making better decisions through your growth in maximizing your margins and your profitability. Beth, do you want to go next uh, with your final call to action? Is that Beck? I'm sorry, did you say Beck? I'm, I didn't yeah. hear you. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, like Mike was saying, absolutely. You know, learn how to leverage your system. Learn how to how to use it to to enable the, the new businesses and, and the the growth of the existing business. And I guess w what I would say is, you know, if you if you if you look at your CTRM system and it's and it's not obvious what knob to turn or or how you can scale it or how you can leverage it. How can I do more with it? Or or if you try to do more with it and it and it doesn't it doesn't act right, right? If it gives you problems or you have reliability or performance issues, you know, that's what Sapient loves to do. You know, we're we're absolutely one phone call away and we can come in and help you figure out, you know, what path to go on to to, to get the most out of your system. Ujo, your final comment, super quick. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think just, you know, Agile is your friend, right? <clears throat> and don't think of it as just Agile uh, technology, but think of it as, you know, getting Agile with your processes and your technology. And there exist a bunch of new technologies right now which will allow you to kind of do this in a much more robust fashion. So it's definitely worth the time and investment to understand it and, and actually do something about it. Thank you very much. I really thank you all, the three of you, because we had the chance to go through a series of elements. So moving from a general, uh, uh, let's say, pressure for uh, for transformation and and uh, and uh, in the in the dimension of growing, not just crunching costs. And we went through different opportunities in terms of business models, so uh, new assets, new geography, new, uh, increase the scale. Um, we had the chance to look at four fundamental elements in the receipt for uh, um, for growth in terms of enabling it, uh, the infrastructure, the data, the processes, a different way of working with the ecosystem. We touch upon um, the, the cloud, scale, agility, flexibility. And um, again, I, 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 I do hope that uh, our audience uh, will have uh, some in interesting thing, uh, let's say, food for thought for uh, for, uh, for the daily activities. And so again, thank you very much uh, to the three of you. And I think I can pass the control back to Joy uh, to see if there are questions from the audience. And thank you very much also from myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberta. That was a fantastic discussion. We do have some questions and only a couple of minutes. So I will start out with this is just thrown out to all of you. How stable is a digital roadmap given the pace at which technology is changing? No, I think that's <clears throat> so. This is usual. I can take that. Uh, I think that's a very good question. Uh, so obviously. Uh, you know, there is a there is an eighty twenty rule here, right? In the sense of you know, you the digital roadmap that you create shouldn't be, as I said, at the nth level of detail, right? What you're trying to figure out is a directional roadmap, right? Uh, and you you want to get at least the direction right, and then as you said, things will change, and you know you'll have to adapt to the change as as you kind of go through that roadmap, right? Uh, but as long as the broad sketches are in place, then you can sort of um, you know adapt on the fly, and that gives you the flexibility. But it, you know you're not sort of you know going nowhere, right? You've at least got a sighting shot of where you want to go. Now it's possible that by the time you get there, uh, you realize that you know your five-year digital uh, roadmap was has completely changed uh, because uh, you know events overtook you. But you know at least you had a you had a framework which you were operating in, and and you know obviously if, if there are if there are unknown unknowns which should have come in, then you're going to be in a situation where that changes. But it's better than you know flying without a map, right? Beck or Michael, do you have any response to that, Roberta? Uh, I I agree with Ujwal on, on that. So I, I think you know he he's basically spot on. Okay. Right. Next question is how how do you expect these dynamics to impact midstream companies? Um, th this is Mike. I, I can go ahead and, and offer some stuff here. I'm assuming the question is is around kind of a traditional midstream company operating in 
North America. And I think some of the expectations here, you know, as people's business grows and volumes grow, obviously that's going to impact the midstream company in having to uh, create more capacity to accommodate the increase in, in, in volumes associated with that. But it may also impact the midstream companies and how they want to deal with some of the commodities that they ultimately become long based upon the type of uh, contracts or processing contracts that they have and that they might be producing more NGLs in, in having to deal with uh, the increased volume of those NGLs and then uh, having to trade or transact differently associated with those. So I think the midstream companies, although you, a lot of people may look at them as kind of a pure uh, services type company and, and just through putting gas, they're also dealing with and becoming long the various commodities and are going to need to make better decisions around how they market uh, the, the, the NGLs associated with that activity. I mean, one very left field impact uh, that uh, that one of uh, our clients is uh, dealing with is um, so there's a pipeline operator uh, who is basically uh, using, you know, drones to actually do pipeline maintenance, right? So it's it's slightly uh, different from what we've been talking about, but it's an example of sort of application of new technologies to this system or to this um, this kind of a, um, a segment, if you will, right? Which uh, actually is leading to quite a positive business case, and they're quite happy with the, the initial results. Thank you. We will take one more question and then wrap up. Um, the final question is, are transactions using blockchain likely to be popular soon? Um, I'll go ahead and, and offer my opinion on this. And, and I think inevitably blockchain will be finding its way into the commodity markets, whether that be around transactions themselves or around uh, assets or even around certificates and those types of things. I don't think it's, it's something that's going to start happening next week, but right now there's a lot of interest in this and there's a lot of discussions taking place about where it will impact the markets, but I think it's just a, a matter of, of time. So I would say in the next, you know, six to 12 months, you'll start seeing blockchain uh, moving into uh, this uh, part of the world in, in commodity trading. Yeah, thank you, I Michael. agree. This is Roberta. And, and again, uh, what we are observing as analysts is uh, initial pilots and initial things happening, but of course we are still far from uh, full commercial uh, adoption. Uh, but but it, it's true that is. Digital ledger, or, uh, distributed ledger, sorry, are one of the technologies that uh, that need to be taken into into the equation in the transformation. Yeah, but this is back. We see the same. We're talking to people almost every day. People are very interested. They're doing, you know, proof of concepts. They're asking us to, you know, tell them what we know and show them some of our proof of concepts and some of our work in blockchain. There is a ton of interest. So, you know, how it really manifests, we're still yet to see, but. And there's, it's going to be here in some way or another. There's, there's just so much energy behind it already. Thank you, Beck. On behalf of Penn Energy and Penwell Corporation, I would like to thank today's speakers and our sponsors, Sapient Consulting and Allegro, for today's presentation. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be reached from the homepage at www.penenergy.com. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants, complete with a direct link to the archive. We thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to serving you with more webcasts in the near future. <laughs>